Hello everyone in CardioMinds channel and welcome to a new spinal video in the guidelines of heart failure and we are speaking today about prescribing one of the important medications for heart failure that all of the patients seek which are diuretics. As we mentioned in the video pharmacotherapy of heart failure, the diuretics, especially loop diuretics, have a class 1 recommendations in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, with signs or symptoms of congestion in order to improve heart failure symptoms, improve exercise capacity, and reduce hospitalization. We didn't mention here any mortality benefit or effect on the survival rate. So much of the benefit is just for symptomatic improvement, which is by the way important for any heart failure patient for his function, capacity, and quality of life. But so far there is no evidence for mortality benefit. And so the aim of diuretic therapy is to achieve and maintain an aovolemic state with the lowest diuretic dose. That's why in some aovolemic or even hypovolemic patient, we can reduce or even discontinue the use of diuretics. That's why diuretic is not an essential medication for all heart failure patients. It depends on your clinical assessment and the symptomatic status of the patient and of course his volume or her volume status. So the first question, why do we prescribe diuretics in order to relieve dyspnea and edema in patients with symptoms and signs of congestion? But it is not an essential medication in an avolemic patient. We are speaking here about loop diuretics and size diuretics because MRA are still diuretics but they have mortality benefits in heart failure not just a diuretic effect. The second question in whom and when do we prescribe them? We can prescribe them in any patient with symptoms and signs of congestion irrespective of LV ejection fraction. So we can prescribe them in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, mildly reduced and also in patient with preserved ejection fraction. And we combine them with an ACE or ARP, a beta blocker, an MRA in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction till signs of congestion are relieved unless any of these medications is not tolerated or contraindicated. Because here we are not looking only on the mortality benefit. The patient is seeking to have symptomatic improvement on the short term. That's why we start diuretics with the other sentient medications. And the classic question, do you choose loop diuretics or cyazide diuretics, which are both potassium-losing diuretics, apart from the potassium-spearing diuretic MRA? We know that cyazide diuretics can be used in patients with preserved kidney function and mild symptoms of congestion because they are low-ceiling diuretics. However, the majority require loop diuretics, or sometimes we can combine a loop with a cyanide and MRA due to severity of heart failure symptoms and steadily deteriorating kidney function because loop diuretics are high ceiling diuretics. That's why we usually start with the loop diuretics with the other essential medications. Sometimes we may need to add cyanide in case of refractory edema. And regarding the contraindications to diuretics, of course, in patients with no symptoms or signs of congestion, I will not prescribe a diuretic and in patients with known allergic or other adverse reactions. And there are some situations in which we need to be cautious with using diuretics, like potassium less than or equals 3.5 millimole, because we are speaking here about potassium losing diuretics. So, of course, hypokalemia may be more aggravated. In case of significant renal dysfunction like baseline kidney function, more than 2.5 milligram or estimated GFR less than 30, because, of course, diuretics may increase the risk of pre-renal failure due to volume depletion. And in case of symptomatic or severe asymptomatic hypotension, of course, diuretics with a volume depletion may result in more reduction in the blood pressure, that's why you need to be cautious and use the smallest dose. And there are some drug interactions that we need to look out for, like combining with an ACE or ARP due to the risk of inducing hypotension, combining with other diuretics, for example, prescribing loop with a cyanide, as here is the risk of hypovolemia, hypotension, hypokalemia and risk of pre-renal failure due to volume depletion is high and prescribing non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because here it may reduce the effect of diuretics especially loop diuretics that's why you may prescribe a large dose of loop diuretic the patient is taking non-steroidal with them he doesn't get the desirable 
effects of diuretic. The third question, which and what dose? Regarding loop diuretics, we have three famous examples. The classic loop, which is fruzamine, with a starting dose of 20 to 40 mg, and sometimes we may reach up to 240 mg because we have the 500 mg tablet of fruzamide. And the much more potent loops like pumetanide and teresamide, we have a smaller starting dose. And of course, the usual dose here is lower than the fruzamide because we are speaking about higher potency. Regarding cyazide, we have three famous examples like pendroflumicyazide, hydrochlorocyazide, which is a famous combination in antihypertensive medications, and we have the much more famous metolazone, which we usually prescribe in heart failure as it is a cyazide light diuretics that we can combine with loop to produce sequential nephronal blockade, as we are going to speak shortly in this video. We have another non cyazide diuretic, which is the endapamide, a famous antihypertensive medication that we usually use in hypertension rather than in heart failure, but sometimes it can be a substitute. We can conclude the answer to this question. What are the settings in which we prescribe diuretics? We can prescribe them as an outpatient in symptomatic heart failure patients and better to start with a lower dose and of course in hospitalized patients with acute heart failure we can start IV diuretics and then switch to oral diuretics before discharge here it depends on the volume status of the patient which is mostly hypervolemic status and now with some of the precautions regarding how to use diuretics first of all you need to check baseline kidney function and electrolyze the same that we have done in ACE and ARP and MRA and start usually with a low dose targeting an effective dose to achieve diuresis and reduction of body weight by about 0.75 to 1 kilogram per day and use the minimal dose to maintain avolemia. We don't have here a target dose that we need to reach. If you achieve avolemic state with the lowest dose, this is acceptable. And adjust the dose according to the symptoms or signs of congestion according to blood pressure and more importantly, kidney function. Then we check the blood chemistry within one to two weeks after initiating the dose or increasing the dose and can educate the patient that they can alter their own diuretic dose according to the symptoms, signs, and sometimes if the patient is well educated about his condition according to the weight changes. And a specialist heart failure nurse is essentially important in this case to educate the patient how to titrate his dose and follow up his symptoms and body weight. And now it's time with some of the clinical problems that we usually face with diuretics. Asymptomatic low blood pressure is common in heart failure patients. In this case, you can reduce the diuretic dose if the patient is not congested because we are not speaking about an essential medication or a target dose that you need to reach. But if the patient is having symptomatic hypotension, in this case, try to stop the other medication like nitrates, calcium channel blockers, or other vasodilators. But if the patient is not congested, consider reducing or even stopping the diuretic. Hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia are part of the pharmacological effect of potassium losing diuretics. In this case, we can increase the dose of an ACE or R, but guided, of course, by the blood pressure. We can increase the dose of an MRA, which is helpful as a potassium spurring diuretic in this case and we can add potassium supplements or magnesium supplements in case of refractory hypokalemia or refractory hypomagnesemia and we rarely have this combination but in refractory cases we may need to hyponatremia is a common observation with diuretics in heart failure patients but we need to differentiate between two types Volume depleted patient may have something called depletional hyponatremia in which he has both deficiency of water and sodium. So in this case, we may consider stopping cyazide or switching to a lube diuretics because hyponatremia is more common with cyazides than lube diuretics, but we may need to reduce or even stop lube diuretics if possible because we are speaking here about hypovolemic state. So, of course, this is justification to stop diuretics temporarily. But sometimes the patient may have volume overload because we are speaking here about hypervolemic state resulting in water retention in excess to sodium resulting in dilutional 
hyponatremia. So here the patient doesn't have deficiency of sodium, but dilutional of sodium. So in this case, we can advise the patient on fluid restriction. We can increase the dose of fluid diuretics because we are speaking here about a hypervolemic state. We can consider arginine vasopressor antagonist like tolvaptin, which act on the vasopressin receptors in the collecting ducts, resulting in water diuresis, not sodium diuresis. So here the patient may have improvement in the sodium level and sometimes in extreme or refractory cases we can consider ultrafiltration. Hyperuricemia is a common side effect with loop and cyazide diuretics because they are interfering with uric acid elimination in the kidney. We can consider allopurinol prophylaxis which reduces the production of uric acid but should not be initiated during acute exacerbation because it may precipitate acute gout arthritis. You can use colchicine for symptomatic gout as an anti-inflammatory medication, but please avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. We mentioned before that they antagonize the diuretic effect of loops and also they may increase uric acid level in the body. Dehydration is one of the famous problems that we usually face with diuretics and you need to be attentive to its occurrence because in this case when you assess volume status and confirm dehydration you need to consider reducing the diuretic dose or even stopping them temporarily to prevent the risk of pre-renal failure and acute kidney injury. In some advanced heart failure patient or sometimes end stage heart failure we may have insufficient diuretic response that we usually cause diuretic resistance or refractory heart failure. What should we do in this case? First of all, you need to check that the patient is compliant to his medications and also to the salt restriction because it may be the key to solving this problem. But if the patient is compliant to both, in this case, we can increase the dose of loop diuretics up to 240 milligram in sometimes for fruzimide. We can administer it twice daily or more, but on empty stomach to improve its bioavailability. We can consider switching from fruzimide to more potent loops like pumetanide or torsamide. And we can add or increase the dose of MRA, which we mentioned it is an essential medication in way in heart failure. But increasing the dose helps to antagonize the secondary hyperaldosteronism, which is a prominent phenomenon in heart failure, antagonizing the effect of loops. And sometimes we may combine loop diuretic with a cyazide diuretic or metolazone to produce something called sequential nephrona blockade. What do we mean with this process or this name? The loop diuretics act on the sodium potassium 2 chloride AT base bump in the thick ascending limb of lobe of henel, which produce significant diuretic effect. And of course, we have the MRA, which is a backup essential medication acting on the aldosterone receptors in the collecting ducts. But we have also cyazide diuretics, which can be added here to act on the early part of distal convoluted tubule. Sometimes we call it the cyazide area. So by this way, we are producing something called sequential nephronal blockade, which act on all the absorbing sites for sodium to antagonize salt and water retention. But if the patient is still refractory, despite all these measures, we can consider short-term IV infusion of loop diuretics as inpatient, or in extreme cases, we may consider ultrafiltration. And of course, worsening kidney function is common to develop with diuretics, especially if you increase the dose, reaching the degree of hypovolemia, resulting in pre-renal failure. In this case, when you are confirming dehydration, you need to reduce the dose or even stop in severe conditions, increase fluid intake, and you need to advise the patient that if he should not have extra fluid, but he should have sufficient amount of water from about 2 to 2.5 liters per day to avoid dehydration and exclude the other nephrotoxic medications that may be co-administered like non-steroidal or trimethoprene, which may be the culprit here. And finally, with the advice that we are going to give to our patient, explain the expected benefits to the patient and tell him or her that he would notice an increase in urinary output. Symptoms would improve quickly in this case because we are speaking about a diuretic effect, which is a good news 
for the patient who is seeking immediate symptomatic benefits, advise the patients to report any principal adverse effect like thirst, dizziness, which may be linked to dehydration or sometimes electrolyte disorder. And in case of thirst sensation, avoid excessive consumption of hypotonic fluids, which may result in hyponatremia. And as we mentioned that we need to differentiate between depletional and dilutional hyponatremia because the action plan is different. As we usually mention, avoid non steroidal for any heart failure patient not prescribed by a physician because here it can cause diuretic resistance, renal impairment, and may result in hyperurethemia. Educate the patient to adjust the dose based on the symptoms, signs, and changes in body weight, and the heart failure nurse can assess the patient for this. And finally, decrease the dose if there is fluid loss, for example, developing diarrhea vomiting or excessive sweating, the patient may reduce the dose or even stop it temporarily, but after consulting heart failure nurse or his physician. So our take home messages at the end of this video today is that despite absent evidence of mortality benefits for diuretics, they are still a cornerstone for short term symptomatic relief and also to prevent hospitalization, which is an important goal for a heart failure patient, plus the other essential medications that are prescribed for long-term survival rate. So please don't tell yourself that diuretics are not important because they don't have mortality benefit like ACE, R, beta blockers, or MRA. They are still important because if the patient is not symptomatically improved, he will be depressed. It may affect his compliance to the other essential medications. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week for another medications for heart failures that we are going to discuss.